morning. All right, you guys, if you want, can open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. We're going to be reading the passage uh, that Pastor Josh is going to be uh, preaching out of this morning. It's Jonah chapter 3, so you can either turn there in your Bibles if you want. If you have a bulletin, it'll be in there as well, or it is up on the screen. So you've got three choices of how you want to read along, or you can just listen if you want. But uh, we're going to be reading Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely large city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days, Nineveh will be demolished. The men of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh. By order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each, each must turn from his evil ways and from the violence he is doing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Then God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for uh, just your love for us. Lord, even as we, as we read this passage, we prepare, prepare to hear the word you have for us. Lord, your, your mercy and love is great towards those who turn to you. And so, Lord, we are just grateful for that and praise you this morning. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be ready to hear, Lord, and ready to turn to you, Lord. Uh, and for those who are running or even for those who have never turned to you before. May you just work on our hearts and prepare our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll start out with a question this morning. Um, a question that you've probably thought of from time to time. Uh, perhaps you, you think of it often. Perhaps you don't think of it as often. But how do you really know if you're saved? How do you really know that you are saved? How do you really know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven when you die? How do you, un how do you know for sure when you stand before the God who created the heavens and the earth, and the God that created you, how do you know for sure that you will be in heaven? How do you know? Some of you have asked that question in your past. Some of you have asked that question recently. The other question that I want to throw past you is, as a believer in Christ, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, how do you know that you're walking in repentance? How do you know that you and God are good? You've accepted Christ into your life. You've asked Him to forgive you of all of your sins. But how do you know that you're walking in total repentance? I know that question's being asked by many of you, and the answers are hard to find sometimes, aren't they? The answers sometimes are not that easy to find, and here's what I mean. I mean, how many times do you have to say, I'm sorry, to God? How many times do you have to say, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I sinned, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I'm going to bed, and I'm sorry, and I'm going to go to sleep. How many times do you have to say, I'm sorry to other people? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I sinned against you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for breathing, I'm sorry for moving around, I'm sorry for being in your life. So many times we've felt that. How many times does it take? A hundred? Five hundred? How many times do you have to ask somebody for forgiveness where it finally takes? How do you know you're walking in repentance before God and other people? Quick story. When Danielle and I were first married, 
Um, I was a fireball back then, like I am now. And, uh, you know, being married, we, we had dated for four and a half years. It was a long distance relationship. We talked to each other for a couple hours, almost every night. We thought we knew each other. We did premarital counseling. We were Christians. We, we seemed to be, you know, set for success. We had, I had a college degree. She had a college degree. She was ready to do hair. I was ready to launch out into ministry of some kind, but I didn't know what. I mean, we were, we were walking down the aisle thinking that we were ready. And all the married people in here (laughs) just laugh, right? Because you know exactly your own experience when you walk down that aisle and when you get married. And when we moved in with each other and we hung out together all the time, and we began to serve together and we began to get to know each other, I could tell you about a hundred stories right now. Right now, that would make you laugh, would make you chuckle, would make you say, Josh, really, really, you were thinking that really? And I would say, yes, I was. One such story, <laughs> one such story um, was we had a, a uh, conflict over some, I think, groceries. I think that's what it was about. Has any couple ever argued over groceries before? Probably just us, all right? And so we're, we're arguing over groceries, I believe. It was something like that. And, and when Danielle has a, has a conflict, okay, my wife will clam up, okay? She will get real tight, and she will get real quiet, and she will not talk to me. And, and, and for me, I, I'm one of those, those blow-up people. I'm one of those guys, let's get this right, right now. Let's talk it out, all right? So literally, we had some sort of conflict. And normally, a husband and wife are wired that way, aren't they? One is more of a clam-up person. One is more of a blow-up person, right? And so we handle conflict. Both are sinful. Both are sinful. Can we say that? Both are sinfully wrong. But we lean toward one or the other. We'll either run away from sinful conflict or we will blow up. And so my my wife is beginning to clam up and I begin to say, that's unacceptable. Right? In my infinite wisdom, I said, that's not right. And so we had a one-bedroom apartment in Ankeny at that time. And I literally followed her around from room to room. Some of you guys can relate to this. And some of you gals can relate to this. This is how you handle conflict. Saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's get this right. I'm sorry, let's do that. Let's, let's get t- together. Let, let's kind of, you know, and, and, and then I started to get angry, right? So then I began to walk from room to room saying, let's get this right right now, right? And uh, the conflict didn't really go away. And I was left, in that first year of marriage, we had many such moments, many such moments. And I was miffed because I was trying to walk in a repentant way, but I, I didn't know what that, really, what that really meant. And I think many of you have experienced the same thing in your marriage. I think many of you have experienced the same thing in your relationships with other people, friends, family. Blow up, clam up, one of those two. Repentance is not being found. You're not walking in joyful forgiveness of the other person. You and God are struggling to get along vertically, and so all of a sudden, everything just feels like it's coming down on your shoulders. You know what I'm talking about? And this sin just avalanches all over your life, and you don't know how to handle it, and you don't know how to walk in repentance. And I would just say this this morning. Now, looking at Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, I, I believe with all of my heart that God wants us to experience genuine repentance for ourselves. It's one thing to, to look at somebody else's marriage and somebody else's relationship and somebody else's story and say, oh, that's really cute that you, got, that you had that experience with God and with others and that you're walking in repentance. It's really cute and stuff, but, but it's another thing to experience it for yourself. Amen? It's another thing to experience genuine repentance deep within the heart and the mind that that gets totally clean with God and totally clean with other people. And I would say God in His infinite wisdom this morning wants us to experience genuine repentance. So let's walk through the story. Jonah 
in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Now look, not many people get second chances, okay? But what do we see Jonah getting here in verse 1 and verse 2? What do we see him getting? A second what? Second chance. This guy is the one who Jesus said, or the, and God said, go east. And Jonah says, okay, I'll go west. He, want, he runs away from God. God sends a massive storm and a fish to get him back on mission. And then God, in all of his grace, gives Jonah a second chance. Now, aren't you thankful for second chances? Are we a room full of second chances or what? Amen. Have you been forgiven by Jesus Christ because... You've been given the grace of Christ and a second chance. So God comes to Jonah and he gives him a second chance and he says, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and then what? He went to Nineveh, finally. This guy finally obeyed the Lord. Now look, aren't you thankful that you always obey God the first time? Praise God. Yeah, I mean, everybody in here, just kind of just smooth sailing, right? God says, Hey, go this way first time. You're like, yes, sir. Right? God says, jump for me. And you say, how high? First time. That's how it always works, right? No. Takes all of that to get Jonah to a place where he's finally ready to obey. And he goes according to the Lord's commandment. And now Nineveh, verse 3, was an extremely large city. A three-day walk. So this city is massive. The population is 120,000. Most scholars say that that's just in regards to the male heads of the house. So you're talking about a city that most scholars believe to be five to 600,000 people large. Okay, now listen, walk you walking into a city of five to 600,000 by yourself with a mission from God. Okay, the Blues Brothers had two guys, Amen. We're on a mission from who? God. Gad. Amen. Jonah's walking in one guy into a city of 500,000 people on a mission from God. All right. And he walks straight into that city. And he set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished or destroyed. Short sermon. And all God's people said, hey, man, I have eight more words, and then we'll close in prayer. Okay? Not really. Forty days, Nineveh will be demolished. He walks in, and you can see this man. He is weak. He is tired. He's physically exhausted. He's emotionally drained. He's spiritually struggling to obey God. And he walks in, and he says, uh... This is all the material that I got. I got eight words. That's all I got. And he walks into the city and he says, 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That went pretty well. Let's try that again. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. I can live with this sermon. Thanks, Shauner. Amen. And so he starts building his volume and people begin... To listen, it's a miracle of God. So he preaches his message in verse 5. The men of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. And all of a sudden we see the power of God in verse 5 show up. Is that a very impressive sermon? Did he know all of, was he studying his Pentateuch really well and know all of his Hebrew history? Or did he just preach a very simple message that destruction was coming? Because of the Ninevite sin. Yeah, he preached a simple message and then all of a sudden God shows up. Amen? God shows up and people start listening and people start not only listening, they start believing what this man says about their need for forgiveness. It's supernatural. They, not only do they believe in God, but they proclaim a fast and they dress in sackcloth. Now, does everybody know what a fast means? That means when you don't eat stuff, okay? Like you give up meals, How many of you gave up a meal this week? No. See, all right. Now, how many of you would be upset if you missed a meal? All right. One meal per day. And let's say you walked into work this next week and they say, hey, no lunch. No lunch. All right. 
How many of you would be like, whatever? Okay, that's just one meal, all right? That's not voluntary, that's pushed upon you. These people were so moved by God and so believing God's word and so believing that they were sinners in need of forgiveness that they proclaimed a voluntary giving up of food. And in America, we just can't even believe that. They gave up food for God? Food for God. They gave up a meal for God. Now look, I've talked to some of you. And I've talked to you, some of you, about fasting. And I've heard it from your lips. You were like, George Bush, read my lips. That ain't happening. All right? I've heard it from some of you. That I could not ever give up a meal for God. Okay, and I'm just telling you. Not only did they believe the word of God, but they said, we will give up meals. And then they started dressing weird. Look at this in verse 5. They, they, gave, they proclaimed a fast, and then they dressed in sackcloth. Sack cloth, all right? It's not really that hard to understand. It was clothing made out of sacks. And all God's people said, I get it. Yeah, I get it, all right? Sorry, I, I, I set you up for an amen, but I meant, you know, just I get it. Sackcloth, okay? That's not like, um, like our, our bed sheets at home are a certain thread count. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, all right? And the finer the thread count, the better the sleep is. Amen? Yes. And so, this is not like your fine thread, all right, clothing, all right? This is people taking off their nice clothes. And I, I see a lot of nice purple today. Whoop, whoop! Yeah. Okay, come on, purple people. Help me out here. Okay, look, I see a lot of good purple in here, all right? It's taking off our fine purple clothing, and it's putting on this rough coarse, hard, uncomfortable clothes and wearing them around for a while. And they did that because they were so burdened because of their sin. That they believed what Jonah said. They proclaimed a fast and then they put on sackcloth and then they put ashes on themselves, which we'll see later on with the king. All because they felt such guilt over their sin. From the greatest of them to the least. And then in verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh. And he got up from his throne and he took off his royal robe and he put on sackcloth and he sat in ashes. The king did this. Right? The king gets word of the city's repentance. And he himself takes off his royal robe, which would be the nicest clothing. And he put on sackcloth, sat in ashes. And then he issues a decree in Nineveh saying, By the order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast or herd or flock is to taste anything at all. Now we're talking not only food, we're talking water now. We're giving up water to get right with God. It's crazy. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both men and beasts must be covered. Sackcloth, everyone must call out earnestly to God. Now listen, man and beast all of a sudden are involved in this citywide repentance. Now look, all of you got dogs and cats. I've been to your houses. I'm like the, I am like the attraction for these pets, okay? I got pastor attraction pants. That's what I got. I walk into your guys' houses and I've got all of your pets with radars going off. You guys got beepers on your pets coming and just like, shoom. I mean, they attack my knees and my shins. I am grateful to God that I still have legs that I can walk on. Of course, I'm being facetious. But you guys all, you all love your pets in this church. You love your pets. Amen. You love your pets. The fasting and the repentance carried over even to the pets and the livestock and the livelihood of this great nation. And they were saying, pets don't eat. All you pet lovers out there, can you imagine your little baby girl, baby boy pet not eating or drinking? A lot of you guys, unimaginable! Get me out of this place. This is crazy. What kind of church is this? Right? King's serious, man. King is serious. You can't eat or drink water. Furthermore, man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, this is just funny. Because a lot of you guys dress up your pets with nice sweaters and sweatshirts. You do, your pets wear nicer clothes than your pastor does at times, okay? And so we're, take, we're saying take off. And listen, I'm not saying it's bad. Don't stone me after this sermon, okay? I'm just saying, listen, take off the comfy clothes, put on the sackcloth on your pets and on your livestock and on every animal that is in the city. That's how serious these people were about their sin. And they must call out or pray earnestly to God. So not only were they giving up stuff, but they were replacing it with with humble, dependent, godly, earnest prayer. Amen? They were P-O-P, power of prayer. Amen? They were praying and earnestly calling out to God. And each, must, each one must turn from the evil of his ways and from the violence he is doing. So they were, they were praying and they were turning away from the violent behavior and the evil habits in their lives. And he says, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger. So God, how does he feel about sin? How does God feel about your sin and my sin according to that verse? God has burning Anger over your sin and my sin. Do you understand that? We think that we can sin and just kind of get away with it. The Word of God says that He has burning anger over our sins of disobedience and evil and violence. He may turn from that and we will not perish. Then verse 10, beauty. It's a beautiful verse. And God saw their actions... That they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented or he pulled back from the disaster that he had threatened to do to them. And he did not do it. He saw the the Ninevites' repentant heart and mind. He saw the the, the outworking of repentance in their lives. And God relented. Amen? He had mercy on a sinful group of people. He had grace to forgive those individuals who genuinely repented of their sin and the entire city was saved. That's pretty sweet, amen? Man, that is good, good news. So I'm going to just fly through some application points of this story. There are five keys of genuine repentance that God has for us to experience, okay? So I'm going to list five keys. We're going to run through some of these just for time's sake. But the first one is is for us to experience genuine repentance. We must, we must hear a weak preacher. Jonah set out in verse 4 on the first day of his walk of the city and proclaimed in 40 days Nineveh will be demolished. Jonah was physically, emotionally, spiritually weak. His message was weak, only seven words. And the city heard this weak preacher. Listen, this morning, I got a cold this morning. I got a cold. Oh, boo-hoo, Josh, you got a cold. You got a cold, okay? No, I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just saying, I got a cold. I'm not, I'm not quite all wired up and wired in this morning because I got a little cold, okay? This week of ministry was crazy. It was awesome. It was tiring. It was exhausting. It was long days. It was short nights of rest. And it was pouring into you... My very life and the gospel's sake. And I know you have a counseling pastor who poured himself out for you in the same way this week. Praise God. Amen. Man, we love doing it. It is exhausting and it is exhilarating and it is awesome. And it is our greatest privilege to do it. But in order for you to experience genuine repentance, you got to listen to a weak preacher. You got to listen to a weak message. You have not only a preacher, okay, but you've got friends, right? When you've been walking in sin, when you've been sinning in your lifestyle, you have a friend, right? Don't you have a friend that is a believer who comes up beside you? Now, listen, when someone comes up to you and talks to you about your sin, for those of you who have had this done, is it a laughy, laughy, joy, joy, hip, hip, hooray time? Is it nerve-wracking? Does your heart beat like like this? Is the conversations oftentimes filled with tears and emotions? Yes? 
Does it often come across perfectly when someone tries to to talk to you about your sin? No, because we're sinners. But does it come across in a weak and humble way? Yes. Listen, if we want to get right with God, and if we want to be saved or walk with Jesus closely, we need to listen to the weak preachers in our lives. We need to listen to those people who care enough to come to us. No matter what we think their motivation is, we need to listen to them and take in the Word of God and take in what we need to hear in order for us to be right with God and right with that other person. We need to hear weak preachers, all right? In order for us to experience genuine repentance, we must have faith in God's Word, okay? The men of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God. They proclaimed a fast, dressed in sackcloth, and from the greatest of them to the least of them. When Jonah preached, a miracle happened. Dead people became alive. A city full of sin became a city full of life and repentance. Jonah preached a simple message, and the people had faith in the Word of God. Now listen, if you and I want to walk in genuine repentance, we must turn our hearts around and believe the Word of God. Amen? You cannot walk in genuine repentance and not believe this book. Right? You can't do it. You can try, but how fun is that life? How fun is that life? It's not fun. It's not joyful. It's not fulfilling because we're denying the very truth of the God that we say we believe in. We must believe God's word. And time, time won't permit me, but I want you to, to take and read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. When you get home, read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. According to which we also walked, according to the prince of, of this world and according to our own flesh. And then our, eye, our eyes were blinded by, by our sin. And then, but God, amen? Right? But God, who being rich in his grace and mercy, caused us to be made alive. By grace you have been saved. Amen? And for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is the gift of God. This is not of works. Lest anyone should boast, right? God takes dead people, he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ into their lives, and they become living people, don't they? Some of you are sinners, and you are hearing this for the first time. You know that you're not going to heaven. You know that you are a sinner, and if you're going to stand before God, you will be declared guilty for your sin. And you're hearing a very weak preacher bring a very weak message about a very powerful Savior, and you are being drawn to salvation. Amen? That's happening to some of you right now. And none of the credit goes to me. None of the credit goes to the environment we set in this gym. The credit goes to Jesus Christ who comes into the lives of sinners. And he speaks into them and he says, I love you and I'm drawing you in and I'm going to make a dead person and a blind person alive. That's a miracle. Okay, now listen, you can all agree with this. The fact that some of you are listening to this sermon is a miracle of God's grace. The fact that some of you are staying awake in this sermon is a miracle of God's grace. Amen. We must hear a weak preacher. We must have faith in God's word if we're going to have genuine repentance. Thirdly, we must abandon our comfort. And I could spend probably a half hour unpacking this point alone in in materialistic America. These Ninevites hear the message of repentance and they give up their comforts in order to embrace what is uncomfortable. They give up their modern conveniences to embrace humble contrition and repentance. And guys, if we're going to be repentant today, we must give up some of our comforts, some of the things that distract us from this word. We must begin to say that I want Jesus more than I want my sin. We must begin to say, I want Jesus more than I want my comfort. I want Jesus Christ and His righteousness and His fellowship and His love for me more than I want my stuff. Now in the days of iPhones, and listen, I got an iPhone, so I'm not preaching against iPhones. Amen? I'm preaching against Samsung Galaxies. (laughs) Just kidding. 
But in the days of iPhones and technology and and cable television and, and every single kind of entertainment in the history of the world, we are distracting ourselves to death, are we not? We are distracting ourselves to death to the place that we don't know who we are. Deep relationships are almost impossible to forge in modern day America because we are so distracted with our idols. And I'm just saying, people, we can't walk in genuine repentance to God and toward each other if we will not run away from what is comfortable and causing us to sin in our lives. We must abandon our comfort, and in order for us to experience genuine repentance, we must embrace earnest prayer. Embrace earnest prayer. It says in verse 8 that, that everyone must call out earnestly to God, and that's prayer. They have a whole city just praying earnestly to God. There was an intensity of prayer in the city. There was prayer meetings going on all over the place, all over the city of Nineveh. There was a sense of desperation for God. And don't you get real prayerful when you're dependent upon the Lord, don't you? I know I do. Like when I've got stuff that's in my life that's bigger than what I can handle, it pushes me, forces me to my knees in prayer. And though I don't enjoy it, I do enjoy it. Does that make sense? I don't enjoy the processes that God uses in my life to push me to my knees. But when I get on my knees in prayer, something supernatural happens. And God answers our prayers. Living waters. We must become a church of prayer. We must. Here, you know, from, from my pastor's heart, and I could stand on my soapbox right now. Okay, I'll pretend this is a soapbox right here. I'm going to get on my soapbox right here and just tell you. It would bring more joy to this pastor's heart to see this many people at prayer than to see this many people here in a sermon. Because the power of God is often cut off in your life and in mine because we don't pray. Our prayer closet should be full of prayers. Praying to a God who does miracles and does wonders and does salvation things in our lives and in the lives of those we care about. All right? Our prayer closets by ourselves should be full of God's answers to prayer. Our corporate experience in small group and at church should be one of prayer. Because prayer is the engine by which change happens. Amen? You ever seen that? Prayer changes things. Have you ever seen that? Prayer changes things, and prayer changes me. Changes my heart. Ch- church, if we're going to walk in repentance, we've got to become a church of prayer. Finally, we, if we're if to experience genuine repentance, we must go the opposite way of our sin. Look at verse 8. Each one must turn. Turn. That means a 180 degree turn from his evil way and from the violence he is doing. If we want to experience genuine repentance, we must go the opposite way of our sin. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 where we are we are called not to live according to the flesh because if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we kill, all right, if we mortify, if we kill our sin and replace it with Jesus Christ and turn, we will have life. We must go the opposite direction of our sin. And so much could be said about that, but I, I want to just close in, in this way. My question to you this morning is, have you experienced genuine repentance of your sin? Have you experienced what Nineveh experienced? And I'm not talking about, did you pray a prayer when you were a kid? Were you confirmed? Did you go to this class and that religious class and this thing and that thing? And do you read a verse of the day? And do you, and do you forward all the, all the Facebook messages that if you don't forward them, you're not really a Christian? Don't you love those? Some of you have sent those. Okay? It's like, look, I'm a believer and I'm not forwarding those things on. Amen? I can love Jesus and make it to heaven and not forward those things on. There's no verse in the scripture that says I've got to forward those things on. Okay, I'm not talking about all of that, all that Christian stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you personally. 
giving up your sin once and for all and tumbling yourselves before the maker of the world and accepting Jesus Christ into your heart and life and making him Lord and master of your life. Have you experienced that before? Believer in Jesus, you who know Christ, are you walking in repentance? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of sin in your life and walk in genuine repentance toward God and toward other people? Are you willing? I can't make you willing. Do you get that? I cannot make you willing to do this. No one in this gym can make you willing to want repentance for yourself. God must do it. Amen? God must do the work in you. So that's how we're going to close. Because if we come to Jesus at this moment, if we come to God in genuine repentance, do you guys know what awaits you? If you decide, I'm going to humble myself and lay down the pride and come before God and get saved or come to God as a believer and get renewed and get revived, do you know what's coming your way? Love, affection, favor, grace, compassion, confirmation, forgiveness. Does that sound okay? that sound all right? The love, affection, favor, grace, compassion, forgiveness, confirmation of God himself will be in your heart and in your mind. God will relent from showing judgment to you on the day of wrath and he will accept you in the beloved. Those are the challenges, living waters. Let's step up and respond to God right now. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your word. Lord, genuine repentance is what we need. Genuine repentance is what you desire from us. And God, every single person in this room, whether they are a Christian or not, needs genuine repentance this morning. Lord, I need genuine repentance this morning as the pastor. Lord, there are individuals in this church that need repentance before you and before others, and I pray that you would empower them by the Spirit to make those decisions. Christ, would you do your work right now? And Lord, if there are some in this gym who if they were to die today, they would be lost, they would be spending a Christless eternity in hell underneath your judgment because they have never surrendered their lives to Jesus. Lord, make them like Nineveh. Make them respond.